from the High Definition Digital Production Center on the Troy campus with news from Troy University locations around the world. This is Troy Trojan Vision Nightly News. Hello and welcome to Troy Trojan Vision Nightly News for February 5th, 2013. I am Caitlin Crow. And I'm Justin Garner. Thank you for joining us this evening. University police are looking for three men responsible for an armed robbery on campus Monday night. Rachel Scarborough has the details, including a new way students can eliminate crime on campus. On Monday night around 7.40 p.m., a male student called in a robbery near Alumni Hall. The subjects got away with some cash and a cell phone. He advised us that uh, three black males um, approached him, um, indicated that they had a firearm, and took uh, some personal property from him. McCall says that if students see anything unusual, they should report it to the police. The big thing we really want the students to, to know is that if you see somebody on campus that doesn't belong on campus, because even the victim in the crime um, stated these, these per perpetrators didn't look anything like a student. And so if you see people on, on campus, especially after hours while it's dark outside, in areas of campus that are not the main areas of, that traffic goes through normally on campus, um, Call the police and let us know about them. We can interview them and talk to them and find out why they're on campus. And just to introduce this week, there's a new way for students to give police information about suspicious activities or crimes, and all students have to do is send a text message. And it's a simple process. Just send a text to 50911 with the subject Trojan Tip along with your message. It'll come directly to, to the police department and to, to my cell phone um, and to the detective cell phones. and. We'll get tips from uh, students, hopefully, that way that'll help solve crimes or prevent crimes in the future as well. That's something that we've had in the, in the works for a while, and uh, because of what happened last night, we decided to go ahead and kick it off a little early and start it right now. So we'll be putting flyers out around campus and the dormitories to let students know what the number is so that we can get everybody aware of what's going on with the, with the text line. Rachel Scarborough, Troy, Trojan Vision News. In addition to the UTIP line, anyone with information regarding Monday night's incident is urged to call University Police at 670-3215 or the University Secret Witness Hotline at 670-5814. But they add that the best way to contact police after hours is by dialing 911. The community that was the scene of a week-long hostage drama is beginning to heal now that the boy has been rescued and the kidnapper killed. Marley Hall has the latest from Midland City. Students returned to Midland Elementary one week after a gunman boarded a bus, killed the driver, and abducted a kindergartner named Ethan. A sign outside the school honors bus driver Charles Poland, who tried to stop the kidnapper. The other side has a happy birthday message for Ethan, who turned six years old on Wednesday. The principal says they're planning a big party for Ethan when his mom says he's ready. Because we don't want to push it on him too fast. Ethan's old bus was retired and replaced with a brand new one. We didn't feel that the healing process would, would go on with that bus still here. A pastor rode to school with children on Ethan's new bus. Several students did not take the bus. School officials say some kids aren't ready. Investigators are still gathering and processing evidence from the underground bunker where suspect Jimmy Dykes held Ethan captive. The FBI's hostage rescue team stormed into the bunker Monday, set off flash grenades and then shot and killed Dykes. The FBI moved in after watching Dykes through a camera that was inserted into the bunker during the standoff. CBS News senior correspondent John Miller is a former assistant FBI director. Cameras can be introduced uh, through fiber optic lenses that can be literally drilled into a pinhole in a wall. Miller says the FBI will not reveal their spy tactics because they want to keep them secret for the next hostage situation. Marley Hall for CBS News, Midland City, Alabama. For now, family members say Ethan is happy to be home and has been playing with his old toys. And tomorrow night, Troy University students will have the chance to show their support for the families affected in the Midland City standoff. Devin Smith, a Troy student from Dell County, is organizing a candlelight vigil for Wednesday night on Sorority Hill. The vigil was originally planned as a show of support for the young boy while he was being held in an underground bunker, 
But now that he is free, Smith wanted to turn the event into a way to support young Ethan and help those families who are involved. We're going to have a uh, card signing for Ethan, whose birthday is going to be on Wednesday, actually. And we also want to start selling these ribbons, which is going to be a dollar a piece or more, if anyone wants, because it's a donation for both of the families. And just, you know, just to get the university and get the community involved and show them that it's not just Del County that was involved with this, that it's a, it's a joint effort and we all are supporting and caring for them and showing that, you know, that it's important to us as well. The candlelight visual will take place tomorrow at 6 on Sorority Hill. Smith says anyone and everyone is invited to attend. Pretty soon some roads in Pike County may be a little easier to drive on thanks to part of over $9 million in funds making their way into the county. $9,839,768. To say that Pike County is planning on some road work would be an understatement. Pike County received some good news from Governor Robert Bentley on Monday. The governor announced a renovation phase for roadways that would end up costing nearly $10 million. ATRIP is the administered federal aid highway program that will fund up to 80% of the construction of important roadway projects. ATRIP loaned Pike County $8 million. That loan plus the over million dollar insurance investment by Pike County will go towards road and bridge renovation. Right now I'm standing alongside Henderson Highway and coming off 231, Henderson Highway gets a lot of business traffic, but this part of the highway is not the problem. The problem lies a little bit down the road. Henderson Highway quickly transforms from a four-way highway to a narrow two. The New Beginnings Church will pretty much be the mark for the new beginning of the expansion of the Henderson Highway. The road renovations are not only going to help with businesses, but they're also going to help improve the flow of traffic, which will make for a safer environment for citizens. The city of Troy and their, and their county government have worked together to make things better for them. That's what we're uh, that's what we're here to do, and that's certainly what's happened in this case. And now taking a look at news from around the state. In Montgomery, the legislator's top financial export expert is forecasting lawmakers will have more money to appropriate for education programs, but less for other state operations. The director of the Legislative Fiscal Office gave legislators a forecast today. And in Bessemer, a spokesman for, a sal for the Salvation Army predicts that a, the Bessemer food pantry will run out of food soon if it's not replenished. Authorities say the center typically feeds 50 to 60 families in need every month, many of whom have small children. And in Ashland, authorities have charged the wife of Ashland's police chief, Benny Davis, with attempted murder after he was wounded by a gunshot. 42-year-old Felicia Davis was taken into custody and is being held at the Rand Randolph County Jail. So to come on Trojan Vision Nightly News, the women's basketball team will be on the road tomorrow looking to make it in two wins in a row. Justin McNelly will give us all the details coming up in sports. But first, getting stuck, stuck in traffic can get frustrating for many commuters. But some places are more congested than others. Oops, yeah, sure. Let's go. Moms everywhere are finding ways to keep kids active and healthy. Works every time. Get ideas, get involved, get going at letsmove.gov. Our e Troy program is one of the largest in Troy University. So whether students take classes in Tennessee or in South Korea or Japan or Vietnam, uh, there is no difference in quality. Get your degree on your terms with e Troy online degree programs. Flexible, accredited, respected across the globe. Troy University, it's all you need to know. My name is Dr. Lee, Troy University College of Education, and I choose Troy. From the High Definition Digital Production Studios of Troy University, you're watching the award-winning Troy Trojan Mission Nightly News. Now for a look at what's happening across the nation and around the world, we'll go to Caitlin Crow at the Global News Desk. Caitlin. 
A new study shows road congestion is costing commuters $121 billion a year in wasted time and fuel. Bagad Shaban reports from Los Angeles. Web designer Andy Schmidt spends about 12 hours each week stuck in Los Angeles traffic. It's like a minimum 30 minutes almost anywhere I want to go in the city, even in the middle of the day. The latest study from the Texas A&M Traffic Institute found nationwide in 2011, drivers spent an extra five and a half billion hours in their cars. They wasted more than $800 each just sitting in traffic. It's more like you have to plan your life around it a little bit. Washington, D.C. has the worst commute in the country. Drivers there need almost three hours for a trip the study says should take 30 minutes. Los Angeles ranks second worst, followed by San Francisco, Oakland, New York, Newark, and Boston. More time idling in traffic also means increased pollution. The study found an additional 56 billion pounds of carbon dioxide was dumped into the atmosphere. Drivers are wasting less gas than they did in 2005. The authors of the study say that might be related to the recession, but that could change. We've seen the congestion in the past sort of rise essentially when the economy has done better. Schmidt says he'll continue to pass the time listening to language tapes in the car. See in Deutschland. He's already nearly fluent in German. It's like, wow, I, that was a good use of my time. So you kind of had the traffic to think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The Traffic Institute is recommending cities look at various ways to improve traffic and shave time off that commute. Begatchaban, CBS News, Los Angeles. A new technology is helping brain surgery residents improve their skills before they practice on patients. Inez Ferrer shows us how it works. This may look like a video game, but it's actually serious business. All right, so let's see if we can stop that bleeding with your right hand. First-year resident Jonathan Rizzoli is using this virtual reality simulator to hone his brain surgery skills. The machine actually simulates the, uh, the sounds, the feelings, um, the, actual, the actual tactile feedback that you would get if you're actually standing there in the OR. Mount Sinai School of Medicine is the first in the U.S. to use the NeuroTouch simulator. Its 3D software and handheld controls closely mimic actual brain surgeries, allowing residents to practice procedures before they perform them on patients. I think it has enormous potential to improve and potentially revolutionize the way we train and prepare for surgeries. The simulator measures speed, accuracy, and blood loss, and if surgeons are cutting away a tumor, it records how much of the growth is removed as well as healthy tissue. Doctors also hope to one day import scans of individual patients onto the device before their operations. If we can practice that in a virtual reality environment, we might be more accurate, and my guess is, and my hope, reduce complications. Dr. Rizzoli tries to use the NeuroTouch two or three times a week. Getting that exposure, getting that early training, being more experienced and being more comfortable in the OR can only be a more beneficial thing to our patients. Stop the scenario. Training to become a neurosurgeon takes seven years. The extra practice on the NeuroTouch may be able to cut down that time. Ines Foray for CBS News, New York. And that wraps things up from the Global News Desk to see more stories from across the world and around the country. Tune in to Trojan Vision Global News right after the nightly news. Now back to you, Judson. Thanks a lot, Kayla. Now Justin McNelly joins us for a look at sports. So Justin, we have a team that's getting ready to head on the road for a big game tomorrow. Uh, that's right. The women's basketball team is actually heading down south to Mobile for a big game against South Alabama, looking to make it two wins in a row. I'll get to that more here in sports. Looking to do something they have been unable to do all season long, the women's basketball team is looking to win back-to-back -back games as they travel to Mobile tomorrow for a midday game with the South Alabama Jaguars. The Trojans were able to snap a season-high 10-game losing streak, and defense was the main key. The Trojans allowed a season-low 61 points against the, to the Raging Cajuns and held them scoreless over the last three minutes. The Trojans will also hope to build some momentum against this in-state foe as Troy is just 2-13 against the Jags since, the, since, this, since joining the Sun Belt back in 2005. While the Jags are 12-10 and 10 on the season, they have lost three straight games, and head coach Chanda Rigby knows she has to have her team prepare for the environment they will be facing. Well, South Alabama game, we're coming off a win. We're trying to turn that into two and get some momentum going here. South Alabama is extremely talented. They're having their high school and, uh, and elementary school day, so it should be a gym pack. That's why we're playing at 11.30 a.m. Um, it should be packed with screaming kids and high schoolers yelling for South Alabama, so that's an interesting environment for us. We just want to go get a win over there. 
Troy and South Alabama will take to the court tomorrow at 1130 in Mobile. And off the heels of its largest margin of victory of the season, the men's basketball team is now sitting at 10 and 13 with a matchup at conference foes South Alabama looming in the near future. The road has not been kind to the Trojans this season as they are just 3-9 and nine away from Trojan Arena with those wins coming against Southeast Missouri, Chattanooga, and Louisiana Monroe. However, the Jaguars enter this matchup with a better record than all those teams with a record of 12-9. and nine. Head coach Don Maestri knew how important this victory was before heading on the road for some tough matchups. South Alabama on the road next. We've got two road games next week. That's another thing. That was why this victory tonight was important. We're getting ready to go back on the road for two more uh, games against South and Middle Tennessee, I think. The Trojans and the Jaguars will hit the court in Mobile on Thursday. Tip-off for that game is scheduled for 7.05. And after an impressive season last year, Trojan catcher Hannah Wren was selected as an at-large selection to the preseason Sunbelt All-Conference team for the 2013 season. Wren started 47 games last year for the Trojans and posted a 286 batting average, primarily from the leadoff position, and had a slugging percentage of 521. Wren also stole 12 bases and 13 chances for the Trojans. Polls have Troy finishing fourth in the Sun Belt behind defending champion ULL and co-tournament champions from last year, South Alabama and FIU. And if you are a fan of Trojan Vision, you might think you are familiar with Trojan Talk. But as Danielle Percival shows us, there is more than one Trojan Talk now on campus. Every Tuesday, Trojan fans have the opportunity to hear the voice of the Trojans interview head coaches about their schedule, team, and what's coming up during the week during Trojan Talk. For me, Trojan Talk is an hour of just providing them a platform and they really run with it. It's a lot of fun. It's a spotlight for them and for their programs. Trojan Talk was previously broadcast off campus at a local restaurant, but recently was moved to campus to the new dining hall. However, that wasn't the only change made in the program. The biggest change besides the change of venue is the, uh, is the time period, and I'm still getting used to that. Uh, normally, Trojan Talk during football season would broadcast live from 7 until 8. Well, it still airs from 7 to 8, but we tape it during lunchtime at Trojan Dining. With the changes that have been made to the program, it's no longer live. However, fans still have the opportunity to participate. If you'd like to submit a question, you can text that to 66856 using the keyword Trojan Talk. Or if you're on Twitter, you can tweet your question at Barry McKnight using the hashtag Trojan Talk. I wasn't sure what to expect because, I mean, I'm familiar with the technology, but not as it relates to, to this program. The, the really important thing for moving here was to relate with the students as much as we possibly can. And the students text and the two students tweet. This is the central hub, you know, especially this time of day. Uh, so to move Trojan Talk over here to uh, the dining hall, I think was a good good thing. Last week when I finished up Trojan Talk, we were able to talk uh, with several students who ended up coming to our games and being some of our biggest supporters last week. And so that's great. It's just a great interaction between the faculty, the staff, the students, and the coaching staffs. Danielle Percival, Troy, Trojan Vision Sports. Trojan Talk airs on WTBF 94.7 FM Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock. So Judson, Caitlin, you know, good luck to the women's basketball team as they travel down to Mobile. You know, hopefully they pick up a win, get some momentum, maybe get a win streak going. You know, men doing the same thing, maybe they can get a big win. Anybody want to listen to Trojan Talk, hear all the coaches, just tune in to WTBF 94.7 FM tonight at 7. All right. Well, we'll definitely be tuning in. Thanks, right. Justin. And still to come on Trojan Vision Nightly News, we'll learn a little bit about Chinese New Year. Plus, temperatures seem to be warming up more this week. What can we expect for the rest of the week, Bree? As we progress throughout the rest of the week, those temperatures will remain constant, but the conditions, however, may change. I'll have more coming up next in weather. I'm Alton Brown, and I used to have a goat. Where did my goat go? Well, it went to a family who really needed it, just like the uh, heifer cow I used to have and the water buffalo, which was really too big for my place anyway. Now, why send livestock? Why not say tractors? Because giving an animal is like giving someone a small business. All that wool, the milk, the eggs turn into income for medicine, school, clothing, a better home, a sustainable livelihood. It even produces fertilizer for crops. And of course, it makes more livestock, because you know, animals make baby animals 
That's what they do. The next thing you know, the family that you gave your gift to is passing on the gift of the animal's offspring to another family who does the same thing and so on and so on until pretty soon you have helped to lift an entire community out of poverty, all with your gift to Heifer International. That is a recipe for lasting change. From the high definition digital production studios of Troy University, you're watching the award-winning Troy Trojan Mission Nightly News. And now Bree Sanders joins us for a look at weather. So Bree, you just mentioned that our temperatures are going to stay about the same, but conditions are going to change. What do you mean by that? Well, it looks like we're going to remain in those high 60s, lower 70s, mm -hmm. but we may have a little bit of rain as we head towards our weekend. I'll get more into that in just a moment, though. Mm -hmm. First, let's take a look at our campus snapshot. Right now on campus, we see that the sun is set perfectly over Bibb Graves, so whether you're headed to class or you're headed out, on the way home, you can definitely enjoy the view outside because it feels great. Current conditions in our area, right now we have clear skies, temperatures at 60 degrees, dew points at 54 degrees, humidity is at 81%, barometers at 30.05 inches and steady. Winds are coming in from the south at about 9 miles per hour. Today's stats, we had a high today of 66, a little 45. There was no rain in our area. The sun rises at 6.34 a.m. and it's set at 5.21 p.m. Temperatures around the state, overall the state is experiencing some warm temperatures right now. Mobile coming in at 65, Huntsville at 62, Birmingham at 64, Montgomery at 69, Troy at 64, Phoenix City at 69, and Dothan at 64. Looking at our temperatures around the southeast on average in our area, today we've been experiencing about a mid 50 degree temperatures right here towards the northern part of the state, but as we move throughout the rest of the southeast, those temperatures increase significantly right there to about the mid 60s in South Carolina. Around the United States, as we take a look at the states as a whole, overall, we're experiencing some cooler temperatures up north, warmer temperatures down south. Current surface map around the United States. A few high pressure systems here in the west, a little stationary front coming through the Montana area. But as we take a closer look into the southeast, nothing too much going on here in our state. A few light winds, high pressure system here sitting in Florida. Precipitation forecast over the next 48 hours, we may be experiencing about a fourth, maybe even half an inch of rain or so. As we move into tomorrow, no rain in our area, but we do see the rain forming right here in parts of Texas and Louisiana, possibly pushing towards our way as we move into Thursday. The southeast as a whole gets covered in rain a lot heavier right here in the Georgia and Florida area, as well as Alabama. Friday, that rain pushes back out of our area into the southeast, and on Saturday, it remains out of our area. We can definitely have a picture-perfect weekend as we move into Saturday. For tonight's forecast, we have partly cloudy skies in our area, about 20% chance of rain. Light winds coming in from the east southeast at about 2 miles per hour with a low of 48. For tomorrow's forecast, we have intervals of clouds and sunshine. Light winds coming in from the south southwest at about 6 miles per hour with a high of 72 degrees. Moving into our four day forecast, like I said earlier, tomorrow the high gets to about 72 degrees with a low of 54. On Thursday, the high gets to 64 degrees with a low of 54 as well. That 80% chance of rain right there, definitely be on the lookout for that. On Friday, the high goes back up to about 71 degrees with a low of 47, and on Saturday, it remains right there at 70 degrees. So, Caitlin Judson, looks like we're going to remain in those warm temperatures, but we will be expecting a little bit of rain on Thursday. But other than that, it should be picture perfect as we head into our weekend. All right. Thank you, Bree. You're welcome. Thanks. This Friday, Troy University's Chinese students will celebrate Chinese New Year, and they want to share the celebration with their American neighbors. Aaron Taylor learns more in today's Trojan Talk. Hello and welcome to Trojan Talk. I'm your host, Aaron Taylor. They'll be talking about the Chinese New Year celebration taking place here at Troy University. My guest today, the organizer of the event, uh, Wei Li, president of the CSSA. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you, sir. And uh, first off, uh, Chinese New Year celebration. Uh, for the uh, folks at home who uh, may have never been a part of one of these, what is the, I guess, the Troy University version of a Chinese New Year celebration? Um, actually, uh, you see, we are like overseas students. Mm -hmm. We just travel in uh, like thousands of miles here. So uh, uh, we CSSA think uh, this is a good opportunity to provide a platform let all the Chinese students and the American students get together and know each other, show you know, our uh, cultures and their cultures. So uh, I think there's a good chance to do that. And it's a fun night, obviously. Uh, food and entertainment. Tell us a little bit about like, all the activities planned for the event. Yes, uh, we have like uh, four, 13 to 14 programs. Um, they include the uh, traditional dance, some modern dance, and singing, stuff like that. Um, it's going to be fun. And the food also is, you know, the Chinese food. 
um, you know, spring rolls and the dumplings is necessary <laughs> and some kind of uh, you know Chinese stuff. So yeah. anyone out there who, who has a taste for Chinese food, having a chance to uh, come and have some of the food, but see a little bit of entertainment. Is it the entertainment uh, put on by the Chinese students as well? Yes, yes. All of the uh, uh, programs are made by you know, Chinese students. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so uh, now you said there's some traditional dance and some modern dance. Yes. Uh, why mix it up? Why have a little bit of both? Obviously, anyone who's been to one of these events knows when you say modern dance, it is what people see, think of modern dance. But why incorporate both modern dance and, I guess, traditional Chinese dancing? Because they, they, um, we do this for like show the culture of uh, variety. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, traditional dance is uh, like an uh, um, important role in every kind of a Chinese party, that's that's necessary, and then we also like to you know share with uh, all the all the people in the world, um, let them know we have students that have talent to do the you know modern stuff. They it's like a breakdown something like mm -hmm. that. Yes. And a chance to to show a little bit of that off. Now, uh, for folks at home who are unfamiliar with. The concept of Chinese New Year. Obviously, Americans celebrated their New Year's on January 1st, but there's a little bit of a difference in the date. Give us a little background on Chinese New Year and 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 what's the differences between American and Chinese New Year's? Uh, uh, the Chinese New Year is uh, like uh, we just go like lunar calendar, mm -hmm. so uh, you know that's not the the first the first day of the year. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, for for this year 2013 is uh, uh, on the uh, 8th February. That's that's uh, the uh, that's the first day of the lunar calendar okay. of 2013. And so that's yeah. why there's a little bit of difference in the date. Now the celebrations themselves over in China, how how do those kind of compare to what you've been in America? So you see what American Chinese, I mean American New Year celebrations are. What is it like back at home? How, how do y'all celebrate back home? Well, we we celebrate back in China for like two weeks or longer. Mm -hmm. uh, we are. Uh, Light up firecracks, fireworks, and uh, you know all the family member um, get together, get a reunion. We call it re uh, reunion dinner, and uh, we eat dumplings. We we eat uh, spring rolls and the uh, fish. The fish is important because it stands for like extra wealth we're gonna have in next year. Okay. Yeah. And, and now obviously, and it's a pretty big event. You said it was two weeks long. It's one of the biggest holidays in China, right? Yes, the biggest. Biggest one. Now, yes. how does it make you feel uh, to be able to share your culture with your American neighbors? Now that you're, you're here in the United States, how does it make you feel to be able to share your culture with the Americans? Um, like, like I said before, we just provide a platform. You know, let all the people get together. Mm -hmm. And that's a... Uh, because I don't think we had you know not of chance to get like 300 or more people in the same place. So uh, um, on this uh, uh, spring festival party, so there will be like 300 or more people over there, and they can know each other, and uh, you know get boyfriends, girlfriends, uh, some new friends from same city. Mm -hmm. So they will feel like home, even they here in America. Well, and if anyone out there is interested in taking part in this, how can they get tickets, and how much are the tickets? Uh, the tickets uh, for the students is ten dollars, and for the non-students is seventeen dollars. And um, you can buy tickets uh, from uh, uh, Maria Fridge's office uh, in Place Hall One Seven One Seventeen. Okay. And, and uh, uh, when and is the event? Uh, it's uh, uh, six p.m. on the eighth uh, uh, February in the Children Ballroom. All right. Well, it sounds like it's going to be another fun year for Chinese New Year celebration. Thanks for joining me here today. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on today's edition of Trojan Talk. That's all the time we have. Now, back to the news desk. And that's all the time we have for Trojan Vision Nightly News. For all of us here at Trojan Vision, thanks for joining us. And tune in again tomorrow night for more news, sports, and weather. Have a great night.